Thank you so much for taking time out to link with us here this evening on Guile TV and uh, to all the folks on the Observer that are viewing us right now. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get down into the meat of the issue here. Over 420 murders so far for the year. And, and recently you said that, reiterating the fact that the best way to tackle crime is a whole of society approach with each citizen playing their role in reclaiming the country from criminal elements. Now, it, 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 in all due respect, that sounds good. It, it really does sound good. But let's remove the colors first of all, whether it be the red and the yellow and the blue and all of that. And let's deal with the nature of this problem, which of course has a lot to do with your specialties, behavioral science. When we look at the broken glass theory, what, what are we looking at? Please expand on that. Right, so, so that is just one very, very small theory in criminology, the broken windows theory actually, and it speaks to the issue of decay in community, meaning uh, broken windows really represents a metaphor. It talks about signs of dilapidation, things like uh, graffiti, garbage lying around, all these kinds of things. What it really signals to would be offender is that there is a very low level of guardianship in that community that people don't really place much emphasis on that particular community and it's therefore more vulnerable. And that vulnerability actually invites criminal activity as opposed to another community, if you go into another community and it's well kept, the lawns are nice and cut and green and the places are locked up and so forth, it sends a message that there are people who care about that community and people who are looking out for that community and it's not such a vulnerable community. So a would-be offender would probably think twice or three times but, and, before trying something and, in a community. And, and that's understood. I thank you so much for that explanation. That's understood because, you know, when you see these people believe these visible signs of crime and disorder and all that really does is help develop more and more crime, sometimes even serious crime. Uh, because that's the environment that has been created. Uh, and go, go back to what many you know, sociologists would say, that we are a product of our environment. Now, coming out of that environment that you just mentioned, uh, one that is, is always said that uh, is an issue of crime, uh, it, it develops into crime because of the environment. How do we get to deal with that? Because it seems here in Trinidad and Tobago, based on our culture, that seems to be a large part of the equation. Right, so, so first let me say, let me preface that by saying that the environment is one among many other reasons that crime may occur, but it certainly is an important one and there is an entire field called environmental criminology which really speaks to that particular issue. And coming out of that, they look at the range of environmental factors that can affect crime, and you're right, there is a lot of research that supports it. And there are interventions that come out of that particular approach. One, for instance, that is well known, is, is that goes by the name of Septed Crime Prevention for Environmental Design. It talks about changing the built physical environment in such a way that it really reduces the opportunities for crime and it reduces, um, you know, the vulnerabilities. So increasing line of, uh, you know, improving line of sight. Uh, surveillance and guardianship and all of the things in the environment right. that really affect it. But certainly, let me hasten to say, as I said, the environment is just one factor. We need a much more holistic approach if we want to properly deal with the crime problem. Yeah, but, but I mean, there's no reset button. Uh, let's be honest here. There is no social reset button. And when you talk about the whole of society in this approach, which each citizen playing their role in reclaiming the country from criminal elements. I mean, at 420 plus murders already, I don't think any of us, law-abiding citizen, wants to go out there and play psychologist with anyone who feels that is their God-given right to jump our walls, open our gates, come through our windows, and violate our family, steal our belongings, and God, for, God hopefully, they don't turn around and snuff our lives out. I mean, at this point in time, that level of interaction has long set sail. 
This is where we are at right now. We are talking about criminals embedded in their psyche is the fact that we are all soft targets. Some of them may even do it for, I don't know if it's comic relief. I mean, what, what do you benefit from robbing a man of his lawnmower while he's mowing the glass, uh, sorry, mowing the grass, or, or, or taking something out of the hand of someone because they're on a date and you're robbing them of their watches? And, I mean, really and truly, when you look at it, the, the, the criminal minds are basically saying, listen, this is a free for all. How far down this abyss have we reached, and is it to the point of no return? Well, first, let me say that I don't think it's to the point of no return, but let me clarify first. When I talk about a whole of society approach, I'm not simply referring to the individual members of society. I'm talking about the institutions and the powers that be as well. I'm talking about a collaborative whole of government, whole of society approach, where we see various parts of the society Society, whether it's you know those that deal with social development, those that deal with education, such as the Ministry of Education, etc. I'm talking about all hands on deck, and whatever contribution that we can make, however small to the situation, let us make it in the fight against crime. So that is what I mean. I'm not talking about the individual citizen in his community just taking matters into his own hands or trying to solve the crime problem, which I don't see as feasible. And so I'll give you a small example. Before I come back to your question of whether we're too far gone, um, if you take the Ministry of Education, that's a good example because the Ministry of Education has the ability to reach every child in this country at a stage in their life, you know, when you can affect them and you can change them. If you put the old adage, um, you know, you, you, could, you could affect a tree while it's still small, that analogy, right? Um, so why not put something in the school curriculum, such as the gang resistance through education and training program, or other things in the school curriculum so that we can affect youth from very small, build the civic-minded youth and all of that. Of course, that's just part of it. We have to create opportunities for them, employment opportunities, etc. But coming back to your question about whether we are too far gone, my answer would be an unequivocal no. We, we've gone really far, I'll be quite honest with you. Right? Um, if you take the gang situation, if you look at the crime situation, we've gone really far. And if we don't do something very, very serious and perhaps very radical, we'll keep going further and further, maybe to a point where we can't come back. And that is what has happened in some places. If you look at Haiti, you look at some places, crime has reached a level, and I would dare say we kind of reached that level here. I mean, we're in the top 10 in the world, and that is that is appalling for a country this size, which is smaller than so many cities in this world. And I understand that, Dr. Sipasar, with all due respect, I understand that each one of us, we do have a role to play, don't get me wrong. But again, we cannot ignore the fact that there's a 300-pound gorilla in the room. So now we have to bring back the colors in. Even if we have, we've taken them out of the equation, the red, the yellow, the blue, the purple, whatever, to represent polit politics. But it has to come back in now. Because you have written the book about gangs in Trinidad and Tobago. We were told, again, as citizens, what we would expect when it comes to national security and securing us as a nation. We were told, we didn't make this up. Dr. C. Posad didn't say it. But we were told that there's legislation that will enable the TTPS and law enforcement to know exactly where the gangsters live, what they eat, if they order a side breast with slight pepper, who's the woman, where they sleep, and unfortunately that in itself did not work. So there has to be more than just legislation. You yourself have said it sometime in the back, it can't just be about militarizing the TTPS. Then what is that missing equation? that is keeping us from getting or to restore harmony to a once blessed twin island republic. What is it exactly? Well, I'll, I'll answer that question for you. And I, I don't think there is a single answer, but I'll provide an answer that, that really helps for something that is totally, not totally, but almost completely missing or too often quite missing. Um, <clears throat> but just to touch on the issue with the gang legislation, the legislation is pretty solid. The issue is the legislation. Quite often, we're good at devising the legislation, but the problem comes in with implementing the legislation. How do we get that evidence, whether it's forensic evidence, witnesses, intelligence, etc., that will stand up in our court of law to secure conviction? So the laws will make certain things illegal. That's well and fine. But really, 
implementing and putting it in action. That's the hard, hard part. Not just us, but everybody everywhere in the world has that problem. Of course, we're lagging behind in terms of technologies, ready access, the intelligence information, and the use of data that we may have, etc. So that, that's one side of it. But let me come back to your original question about what might be missing. And in my mind, the massive, massive thing that is predominantly always missing is an emphasis on prevention. We have, in the Ministry of National Security, for very long with successive governments, gone down the path of only using a crime suppression approach in dealing with the crime problem. Meaning, and I'm not saying crime suppression isn't important, but meaning that the emphasis is on the prison, the courts, the police, um, the defense force, etc., etc. You know, dealing with crimes when they happen, reactive after the fact, but all of the things that are creating the crime problem in the first place, they, they just remain untouched. Whether it's issues in communities, lack of, uh, you know, employment opportunities or other types of opportunities, failure in education for certain groups of people, social stigmatization, problems in family, all right. yeah. you name it. We don't, we don't touch those things. We leave them alone. I don't know if it's considered but, politically oh, uh, risky I, to do so. Understood. Understood, Dr. C. Prasad. Uh, and again, it goes right back to what you're saying. Everyone has a role to play, but for some people, that role may not be laid out clearly. It may not be crystal clear. And I think we, we need to understand that if all stakeholders are on the same page, then yes. But if you have a parent that believes that the teacher who is at school doing his or her job has to do the parenting for them, then you have a problem. If you are the parent who believes that members of the TTPS is there as an extended part of the family, then you have a problem. Teachers are there to teach. At the end of the day, the police is there to do their job. They are not going to console your child or try to give them. If they break the law, then so be it. Where do we understand that these lines are so blurry that we keep talking about this over and over again, but not understanding the responsibility? Or is it basically clouded with hypocrisy? No, no. People have clear lines of responsibility. But what I'm saying is that there may be the need to rewrite those lines that we think, you know, how we do certain things and why, right? Yes, the Ministry of Education has a certain responsibility, which is a very important one. But I'm simply saying here that that responsibility could be expanded a bit to include something more and wouldn't really take that much effort, right? So what I'm suggesting is a closer level of collaboration amongst the agencies that could help in the fight against crime. So, for instance, the Ministry of National Security, asking yeah. the Ministry of Education, can you include this in the curriculum or that in the curriculum to help build a more civic-minded nation or to help uh, equip youths with the skills so that they have the ability to resist joining gangs if people try to recruit them into gangs. And this is what I'm saying. Understood. And, and if you had to look at what's happening now to the point where, I, I mean, as far as petty crime, because it goes back again, as we started, with the uh, broken, broken windows uh, theory, that if you neglect or simply just brush off what we view as petty crimes, whether it be loitering, obscene language, uh, drunk and disorderly behavior, all of this, of course, becomes compounded. And, and helps to bring that environment of law and disorder. Uh, yeah, you're totally right. Because what, what the, a lot of the research will show is that, you know, people at different ages engage in different types of behavior. And at younger ages, you will quite often find the persons engaging in simpler types of deviance. But then they graduate to much more serious types of deviance. And persons who engage in deviant behavior including criminal behavior, will tend to hang out with people and be in those kinds of social circles where they socialize into that life and where they have that opportunity. So, so you're absolutely right. It's something you need to, to tackle it in its infancy and even in its simple form. All right. Before it gets out of hand. Thank you. Dr. Sibir, I want to thank you so much for taking time out this evening. You've definitely shed some light on this topic. And I hope that we have a part two to this because there's a lot that we need to cover. And again, thank you so much. Any closing comments? Oh, my, my pleasure. Absolutely. I mean, I, I very much look forward to chatting with you further. Thank you so much. Thank you.